week we are in chapter 18 of The Story, Randy Frazee's 31 chapter chronological ordering of going from Genesis to Revelation. Last week we talked about the fall of both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And so now we are following a group of God's people from the kingdom of Judah into Babylon. They're no longer in the promised land. They're no longer uh, where the temple is. In fact, the temple is completely destroyed. And so we're following them. What's going to happen with God's people in a foreign land? Have you ever experienced the disorienting feeling of visiting a foreign country? Um, Despite going out of your own free will, you still experienced a level of nervousness, I would imagine. New foods, new language to adapt to, different currency, different social customs and expectations. Uh, And you may have enjoyed being a tourist for the duration of the trip, but there was the constant reminder on this trip. With every word that you didn't understand, and every local who gawked at your awkward appearance and your clothes, and every time you ate mystery meat and you thought to yourself, this tastes a lot like chicken. All of that was one big reminder that you're not home. Um, Over the last 10 years of full-time ministry living in Indiana and Texas, if I had a penny for every time someone told me I wasn't in Kansas anymore, Toto, I would have about $5 to cash in. Um, There's just something about being home, even after an enjoyable trip abroad. Uh, There's a sense of comfort. There's a sense of identity that we get from home, a sense of belonging that comes from being at home. Uh, Many of you know Brad Nix from First Baptist Church. He is the choir director there, and he is uh, really the the main choir director for the joyous Christmas that has taken place the last two years at the PAC Center. Well, Brad and I have become friends, and uh, him and his wife and his family lived in Kansas for uh, a number of years, about 10 years. He was a music professor there at a college, and they invited us over a few weeks ago for chili. And whenever I hear chili, I go back to my Kansas days, my Kansas upbringings. You see, there was... uh, Whenever you had chili in school, there was one other item that you had with chilies. Anyone, can anyone tell me, anyone from Kansas, huh? Not beans. No, well, that, that, see, that's all Texas stuff. Did, okay, well, you're from Kansas. Did anyone say cinnamon rolls? Right back there. Thank you. Are, are you from Kansas? Or have you been there? From Montana, so maybe it's like north of, you know, the Oklahoma line or something. Uh, Every time, (laughs) that really got a buzz. That's good. Um, Oh. So every time they serve chili in the public schools in Kansas, you had chili and cinnamon rolls. Now, some people would eat the chili and then eat the cinnamon rolls afterwards, but let me tell you a, a secret. Let me tell you a secret. The, you know how the cinnamon rolls come apart and you can rip them apart? Use that as a spoon in your chili the next time you do it. I promise you it will change your life. Don't knock it until you try it, okay? Just try it. I will eat a mushroom if you will do that, all right? How about that? Um, <laughs> so when we went to the Nix's house, I went to their house and, and, I, and I kind of brought that up to them and knowing that they had been in Kansas for a certain amount of time and I said, so um, when, when your girls were growing up in, in school, what, what did they get? Was there something in particular that they got with their chili? And he said, oh yeah, cinnamon rolls. And lo and behold, they had baked a pan of cinnamon rolls for us that day. I felt so at home in the Nix's house. I've been going back every week and spending time with them. Um, <clears throat> So there's something very encouraging, something very relaxing, something that speaks to the core of who we are when we feel at home. Uh, But it's it's really hard for us to grasp how disrupting it was for the people of Judah to be ripped from their homeland and brought to this foreign land, away from home. Uh, Just a few years ago, when I was doing my seminary classes, I got to meet uh, a lady who was an Iraqi refugee. And she, has, she was raised in a very ancient Christian tradition there in Iraq. And when the Iraq war was going on, her and her family had to flee from Iraq because of all of the upheaval. And so I got to, to talk with her and ask her some, some things about her life and, and the experience of moving to America. Of course, you know, 
as Americans, we think someone comes over from another country and we're like, the American dream, they've got it all made, life is good for them, you know, because that's kind of our perspective of things. But she comes over and she began to tell me the difficulties and the hardships that it was to be a refugee from another country. You know, she was talking about going from living this normal life, raising kids, working, uh, having a neighborhood, a community of people that you knew, and it's all that you know, and you go from that and in an instant your whole world is turned upside down. And in the matter of minutes, in the matter of instantaneous minutes, we have to decide what do I fit in my suitcases and my bags so that we can flee from this place and save our lives. And then the questions continue from there. You don't know where you're going. How are you going to survive? Where is your next meal going to come from? If everyone in your family is with you, are they going to have a bed that night or the night after. These are some very disorienting thoughts, and, and really, I think maybe even some Bastropians know what that's like. After the 2011 wildfires, with, within just minutes of notice, you had to pack things up, and you had to make plans to, what am I going to do now? What's tomorrow hold? And, and in many ways, going through something like that really helps us to sympathize with others who have had to do similar things. I mean, just The last year, 2017, if you think about all of the events that caused people to really be a refugee in their own towns, a refugee in their own states, Uh, you think about Harvey and and Irma and and California with the wildfires and the mudslide that just recently happened. So to, to the Israelites, for them, the temple was a central, very central part of their faith. And the last image in their mind before leaving their home was its complete and utter ruin, its destruction. The temple was on fire. The temple was God's home among them in their homeland. But as they're moved to Babylon into this foreign land, there is no temple to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So it would be, it would be very easy for if, if you were one of these exiles from Judah to conclude that if there's no temple to God here in Babylon, then it would be that then God is not in Babylon with us, that we are by ourselves, that we have been forsaken, that we have been abandoned. We're going to have to make it on our own in Babylon. A whole new generation of Israelites would be raised in a foreign country, learning new languages, customs, traditions, eating new foods, expected to worship other gods. This is just to list a few things that these people from Judah would have to go through in this exile. And so in chapter 18 of the story, we focus on the book of Daniel and and the stories that surround the characters of Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. Now, as I say those, those words, those names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, perhaps you know those other names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, I could have given uh, Chuck the passage that read through the story of, of uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And as I was reading through all the names, and all, I thought Chuck will be much more pleased to read from chapter 6 than chapter 3. And uh, so anyways, you can thank me later. Um, <laughs> there are these, these four young men who came in the exile from Judah. Young, probably mid-teens, 15, 16, 17 years old. And as they are adjusting to life in this foreign country, King Nebuchadnezzar told the head of his palace to go and to find the best and the brightest and and the most good-looking young men that came from the exile. So so ladies, look at your husbands and you'll know exactly what this scripture is talking about. The best and the brightest and and the best-looking. Oh man, it is silent in here. What is up with that? Oh my goodness. So these men would go through three years of training to learn the Babylonian life, to learn the customs and political traditions and learn about their gods and their way of life. And and so they were handpicked and they were given new Babylonian names. So hopefully they would forget their old Judaic names. So we have Daniel whose name meant God is my judge. He was given the name Belteshazzar, which means Bel's prince. Bel was one of the gods of Babylon. Hananiah, whose name meant beloved of the Lord. His name was given, uh, he, he was Shadrach, and Shadrach means illumined by the sun god. You have Mishael, whose name meant who is as God or who is equal to God, and he was renamed Meshach. 
which was who is equal to Venus, the, god, the goddess Venus. You had Azariah, whose name meant the Lord is my help. And he was renamed to Abednego, servant of Nego, which was another one of the Babylonian gods. You see, they were not only taking away the identity of their Hebrew names that told them about who their God was, but then they were giving them these Babylonian names that would then try and hopefully maybe readjust them and, and, and cause them to worship and serve other gods and not just say that there is only one true and right God. So don't overlook the importance of the name changes here for these men, for these four men. The question would be, here in Babylon, as their names are changed, is God still my judge? Am I still a beloved of the Lord? The question would be, is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is he still God Almighty? Number one, whom no other God is equal to. The question would be, is the Lord still my help? Even though we're not in Jerusalem, even though our names have been changed, are these things still true of God? Now, I'm sure for some, it was mighty tempting to take on the new names, the names of gods that they could see engraven and carved images all around them in Babylon, the names of gods whose temples were still standing, the name of gods that, that maybe wouldn't abandon them and cause them to leave their homelands. Maybe it was time for a fresh start. Maybe it was time to, to have some new perspective. But for our friends, for Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, life was about to be good. Along with their new names came new foods and new drinks that they were enticed with from the king's menu. You can have the king's food, you can have the king's drinks, but as we read in the book of Daniel, and I encourage you to, to do so this week, they refused to eat the king's food and drink the king's drinks. Instead, they asked to only eat vegetables and drink water for 10 days. Oh my goodness, can you imagine only eating vegetables and drinking water for 10 days? I'm, I'm, can you imagine that? It's, I'm, sure, I'm sure I could probably stand it, just eat vegetables and drink water for 10 days. That would probably do me some good. But they refused to eat the king's food and drink the king's drinks. And they said for 10 days, we're gonna trust in God that as we eat these vegetables and drink this water, that at the end of 10 days, we will look just as healthy and robust as all of your other men who are being enticed by the king's foods. And sure enough, God's favor was upon these four men. And at the, at the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and more robust than any of the other men who, who divulged themselves in the king's food and drink. But why the big deal? Why the big deal? Why not just eat the king's food and drink his wine? You know, for some who believed that God had abandoned them and shipped them off to Babylon and left them to die, perhaps the mantra of eat and drink and be merry was appropriate. Because we have nothing else. We have nothing left. But for Daniel and for Hananiah and for Mishael and for Azariah, faithfulness to God mattered because God was still faithful to them. That was the key part in their understanding. They may be far removed from the promised land and the temple may lay in ruins, but God was still with them despite what the outlook appeared. These men remained committed to serving God even in Babylon and they received favor from God. And through all these experiences and God's favor upon them, Daniel was made a governor in Babylon. And Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were assigned administrative posts all throughout Babylon. But there came a moment of testing for Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. There's a story in chapter 3 of Daniel where King Nebuchadnezzar decided to erect a large statue of gold, 90 feet high, nine feet wide. If you can imagine the, the expense and the value of this high and, and massive and beautiful statue. And, and to King Nebuchadnezzar, his instructions were simple. All you got to do when, when the national song is played, worship the statue. That's all you got to do. I mean, it's impressive. It's 90 feet tall, nine feet wide. It's made of gold. You know, why not just bow down to this gold statue? The question for them is, what would you do? And maybe the question for you, what would you do? Has anyone seen that show on ABC, What Would You Do? 
It's a show where they, they find people in ordinary life going to cafes or going shopping or going to work, and they put them in situations of maybe seeing a robbery taking place. And they got hidden. It's almost like candid camera in a sense, if some of you remember that. And, and, and you, so you're going along, and this guy is stealing a lady's purse off of her table while she's not noticing. But you notice, and the, and the question is, and the cameras are capturing what would you do in that instance? Would you get up and chase that person down who stole the purse from this lady? So there's all, there's all these instances, and I love watching this show because it goes down to the core of that question for us. What would you do? Putting yourself in the place of people having to make decisions of integrity. Because that's really what it comes down to. Why not just bow down just for this one thing? Keep the good times rolling. Keep the king happy and continue to live in peace. So this is the predicament that we have. Do we or don't we? This was a test of integrity for these young men. And if we want to define integrity, we talked a little bit about it in Sunday school today. Here's what uh, the, the, the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary says is integrity. It says integrity is a firm adherence to a code or especially moral or artistic Values, a firm adherence to moral values that doesn't push you or sway you in any other direction, no matter what comes about in life, whether good times or bad times, that you hold on tight to these moral values in your life. This test of integrity comes when someone is tempted to throw away their guiding sets of morals and values, even if for a moment, just to take an easier path. It would have been so much easier just to quickly bow down before this gold statue, make the king happy, continue to live in peace. But instead, our friends, Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, they went to the king and they said, we will not bow down to the statue. We serve one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. King Nebuchadnezzar came to them and confronted them and asked them, why are you taking the stance? Why won't you just bow down to this golden statue? And the response comes in verses 16 through 17 of Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Listen to this next part. But even if he does not, even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. What a, what a, what a test of integrity and what a response. No matter what, you know, we're not going to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We serve one God and that God will save us. But even if he doesn't save us, we're standing firm in our decision to serve this God in our lives. And so King Nebuchadnezzar had this furnace heated up to seven times hotter than its usual. And Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah were thrown into the furnace. End game. Sorry, guys. You should have listened to the king. That's it. Well, Instead, King Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace and he sees where these three men would be. And instead of seeing three, he sees a fourth person in the furnace walking around with those men. And so here's, here's King Nebuchadnezzar's response to seeing these four men in the furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Some of your translations say the fourth looks like the son of God. And from that point on, King Nebuchadnezzar praised the God of Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. And so as we come to this point of understanding these stories, putting it together, you could sum up chapter 18 of the story of Daniel and his friends in Babylon with the biblical truth that we find all throughout scripture, and it's this. It's this one biblical, script, one biblical truth from Genesis to Revelation is that God is with us. Amen. God is 
with us. Yes, even in exile, even without a temple, even in the face of persecution, even in the face of a fiery furnace, even in the lion's den, God is with us. Our Sunday morning worship as Christians has its roots in historical Jewish synagogues. You see, the earliest Christians came out of this Jewish religion where they met together in synagogues once a week, where they would worship and pray and study. And can you guess the period of time in in Israeli history when the synagogue actually took place, where it started off? It was in the time when God's people were displaced from Jerusalem, no temple, They gathered together in Babylon on foreign soil. They prayed, they worshiped, and they sang the God who never left them once. And so we as Christians, we have this this interesting correlation that we gather together in this place as people who, who are not citizens of this world, but we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We find ourselves on foreign ground. We find ourselves in Babylon, and sometimes we find ourselves where it seems like the temple is long gone, that God's presence is no longer with us. But we are reminded that God is with us just as he was with them. You see, for Daniel, for Hananiah, for Mishael, and for Azariah, their identity as people of God was not found in the promised land. It wasn't found even in the temple. The identity of these men was found in God's faithfulness and his loving kindness towards them. And so as we close up today, my question is, as Christians here in Bastrop, here in hashtag my Bastrop, At Bastrop Christian Church, where is our identity found? What is our love for one another rooted in? Why do we love our gatherings on Sunday mornings? Why is it that visitors feel at home among us? Is it just because of our location? Downtown? beautiful building? Is it just because of that? I would say it's so much more than just our location. It's so much more than this building. This building is, is temporary. We're reminded this week as we're seeing these rotting panels having to be replaced that our temples may deteriorate and we may find ourselves walking in Babylon or standing before a fiery furnace, but God is still my judge and there is none equal to him. We are still his beloved, and the Lord will always be our help. And so the words from Isaiah 26, 4, to take with you this week, trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. May you stand upon that everlasting rock this week and take the love and the grace and the peace of Jesus into your neighborhoods, into your workplaces and into your homes. It's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This morning,